uh, Dr. Sean O'Mahony and Dr. Mimi uh, Mann. Dr. Sean O'Mahony is an Associate Professor of Hospice and Palliative Medicine and Director of Palliative Care with Rush University Medical Center. His research interest focuses on pain management, hospice, and palliative care programs. Dr. Mann is a nurse practitioner in pain and palliative care at the National Institutes of Health. She pre previously worked at the University of Pennsylvania and other healthcare institutions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. O'Mahony. Uh, I'm going to talk about managing pain for uh, patients with GVHD. Um, most of the patients that I take care of have chronic medical illnesses. Uh, we take care of patients in the context of when they're in the hospital having stem cell transplants, and we also see outpatients in the cancer center. Uh, there are many barriers to effective pain management. Uh, so, surprisingly, uh, the majority of medical students in this country will not have had formal didactics on pain management. We surveyed incoming medical house staff at Rush a few years back and found that 80% of them could not recollect having had a formal didactic on pain management at an undergraduate level, as a consequence of which we get all of the medicine interns for a week uh, to teach them about pain. Uh, many providers have misconceptions about the risks of side effects of medications. Uh, we tend to underutilize the full complement of treatment resources. Uh, we're not aware of what other professionals can do, so uh, the majority of um, physicians will not have had exposure to uh, occupational therapy or physical therapy at an undergraduate level. Uh, Mimi, do nurse practitioners? Uh, rotate with OTs or PTs? Not traditionally. Okay. I mean, it, it depends. Those who seek it as an elective can do it, but it's not their recurrent. Okay. Um, serendipitously, there's uh, an occupational therapist who works in my clinic who's interested in chronic pain. And uh, we make sure that all of the medicine interns will spend some time with the occupational therapist to learn about the modalities that they can provide. Uh, many times uh, physicians will not believe a patient, uh, that the patient has uh, chronic pain, uh, and we're often not routinely using evidence-based distress screens which can elicit the presence and severity of many symptoms. Um, not, not enough uh, providers are trained in supportive care of patients with chronic illnesses. Uh, pharmacies will often not stock medications that may be effective for symptom relief. Uh, there are many uh, restrictions on what medications or interventions a person can receive. Uh, and there are often uh, restrictions on what type of care provider people can visit. Uh, so many times uh, a psychologist who, or a social worker who can teach patients about uh, mindfulness modalities uh, there are huge co-pays to see those providers, so it's outside the, um, uh, the range of a patient to be able to, to see that provider when they've depleted their financial resources. Uh, there are different types of pain, and uh, there are different approaches uh, to the different types of pain. So neuropathic pain is uh, mediated by injury to a nerve. Uh, Non-neuropathic pain can be somatic or pain involving a bone structure or a joint. It's typically well localized. Visceral pain is uh, pain mediated by uh, an injury to um, an organ such as uh, the, the intestine or the bladder. Uh, pain can be acute if it's limited to a period of one to three months or less. You can have recurrent acute pain. Uh, where patients have bursts of pain for time-limited periods, or chronic pain, which is pain which has been present for one to three months. Patients with neuropathic pain may describe their pain as being shock-like, uh, electrical. They may describe having pins or needles. They may have a terrible itch in the area that is supplied by the injured nerve. Um, it's often associated with change in skin sensitivity. So the skin may feel very sensitive or there may be loss of sensitivity. So patients with um, uh, peripheral nerve injuries may uh, find that when they're, they're walking, it feel, feels like they're walking on cotton wool. 
uh, somatic pain is typically well localized. Um, classically, it might be in somebody who's got a bone lesion or injury to a joint. Uh, the pain is typically made worse by weight bearing or change in activity. Uh, visceral pain is crampy. It's possibly associated with nausea or urinary or gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, so pain is, is not just related to injury to um, a body structure. It, it uh, involves pain perception and it's associated with suffering. So commonly patients with chronic pain will have depressed mood and the depressed mood is made worse by the chronic pain um, and the, the pain makes the depressed mood worse. Typically in acute pain patients will often have high levels of anxiety. So the approaches to uh, cancer associated pain uh, tends to be multidimensional. Uh, one type of intervention is typically going to have limited efficacy, so people should be approached with a whole, whole person approach. Uh, commonly uh, in GVHD, people may experience muscle cramps. Uh, they're often not disclosed by the patient to their provider. Uh, it's often relieved by stretching. It occurs in um, slightly less than a fifth of patients who have GVHD. Uh, often occurs at rest, often worse at night, uh, but may be induced by exercise. Uh, calf muscles are commonly involved, also the hamstrings, hands, forearms, and thorax, or the, the chest. Uh, it often interferes with sleep. Um, there can be difficulty with exercise and breathing during and after the painful contractions. Uh, magnesium uh, can help about two-thirds of patients. Uh, quinine uh, helps less than half of patients. Quinine um, can uh, cause things like uh, uh, dizziness, uh, hearing loss, or um, tinnitus, or ringing in the ears. You probably, if you've experienced this, been offered these medications uh, earlier than you were offered the first couple of interventions. Uh, related again to our lack of um, formalized education in this area. So pregabalin, uh, the brand name of which is Lyrica, gabapentin, the brand name of which um, is Neurontin, and carbamazepine have lower response rates. You probably will not have been offered uh, carbamazepine because this anti-seizure medication will commonly uh, reduce um, uh, blood counts. Uh, muscle stretching is usually effective at stopping the cramps, except when the pain is severe. Um, fasciitis uh, is inflammation of the connective tissue beneath the skin. Uh, polymyositis uh, is inflammation of multiple muscles. Uh, polycyrusitis is inflammation of tissues. Uh, lining the internal organs or body wall tissue. So that might be inflammation of the pleura, which is the tissue that lines the lung. Um, arthralgias is the medical term for joint pain, and myalgias refers to muscle pain. Um, pain in uh, cutaneous sclerosis or sclerosis of the skin uh, may cause limitation of mobility over joints as well as pain. Mm -hmm. It often responds to moist heat, paraffin, and ultrasound prior to stretching for 15 to 30 seconds uh, and should be repeated several times. Uh, connective tissue scars that are forming can be reduced by topical treatments such as moist heat, uh, emollients, massage, stretching, and the application of pressure. Heat up to 113 degrees Fahrenheit improves the stretchability of collagen. Uh, friction or deep friction massage is the primary method of preventing or, or treating the adhesion of scar tissue to deeper structures, uh, but requires systemic control of GVHD as mechanical irritation may lead to increased inflammation in uncontrolled GV GVHD. People with uh, fasciitis uh, may describe a feeling of stone-like tightness with clearness of the overlying skin. 
physicians tend to use a lot of uh, fancy terms. So uh, when my slides were being reviewed, I, I initially used lucidity and struggled to come up with a plain English uh, translation of that so, so that it would be readily understood. Um, people may decide to do a biopsy or MRI to elicit diagnosis. It's often progressive with marked uh, impairment of quality of life, with joint stiffness, uh, reduced range of motion, sores, impaired wound healing, and shortness of breath. Physical therapy modalities are effective for this syndrome. So heat, uh, joint mobilization, uh, lymphatic drainage should be started early to reduce uh, joint contractures or stiffness. Uh, but caution is needed in the early phase where there's a lot of swelling as inflammation may increase the mechanical irritation. Uh, oral GVHD, as you're all well aware, may be associated with mouth pain, ulceration, inflammation, sen sensitivity, limiting the ability to eat and drink, and causing marked impairment in quality of life. Um, Helpful uh, interventions alongside uh, topical and intralesional steroid, steroids might include pilocarpine, topical antifungals, uh, fluoride topical analgesics, um, things like magic mouthwash containing local anesthetics and antihistamines and viscous lidocaine. Um, vitamin D deficiency is a, a common uh, complication in patients who have had stem cell transplant. Uh, it's also associated with gastrointestinal GVHD. People with uh, vitamin D deficiency are more likely to have osteoporosis. Uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency is commonly associated with bone fractures and bone pain. Um, so talk with your physician about uh, supplementation. Abdominal pain and cramping will occur in about 60% of patients with uh, gastrointestinal GVHD. Other common symptoms include loss of appetite, diarrhea, and weight loss. Uh, adjuvant medications um, are medications that have a primary indication for the treatment of conditions other than pain. Uh, so uh, classically, that might include an antidepressant for neuropathic pain or an anti-seizure medication. Uh, for cancer neuropathic pain, uh, the most commonly used um, adjuvant medication is gabapentin or Neurontin. Uh, about a third of patients will achieve a 50% reduction in pain intensity for chronic neuropathic pain with gabapentin. And this is a recurring theme with a lot of medications. They have, have limited efficacy. Um, other examples of medications that are used to treat depression uh, that might be effective for pain inc include norotriptyline, amitriptyline or vanlifaxine, as well as local anesthetic medications such as topical local anesthetics, uh, such as uh, eutetic mix of lidocaine and prilocaine patches or EMLA um, uh, cream and dressing. Um, how many patients uh, in the room are, are using narcotic medications or opioids? Um, so a fair few. A fair few. Um, uh, opioid medications had been the mainstay of cancer pain until the last several years. Um, they include medications such as oxycodone, morphine, fentanyl, hydromorphone. Uh, approximately a third of patients with chronic pain will have effective relief of pain. More patients who have active cancer diagnoses uh, will achieve fair control of their pain with limited side effects with opioid medications. Uh, a similar proportion of patients uh, to the one-third of patients with chronic pain who achieve relief uh, will discontinue opioid medications for lack of e effectiveness or side effects. Um, the duration of most pain medication clinical studies uh, are typically three months or less. Um, I saw a study of a, a new novel agent uh, recently that was six months, but typically they're, they're only about 12 weeks or less. And typically we only see the emergence of um, uncommon side effects after um, the uh, pre-marketing studies ha have been done. Uh, these studies will typically exclude patients with mental health problems. So 
the eligibility criteria will screen out people who have mental health problems who are more susceptible to the side effects of opioids. Uh, they typically will exclude older adults and they will also exclude patients with other chronic illnesses. Common side effects of opioid medications include nausea, vomiting, constipation, drowsiness, problems with concentration and itch. Uncommon side effects include addiction, which will occur in about 10% of patients who use these medications. Um, not uncommonly, people will have hives, which are caused by the release of histamine from mast cells. Occasionally, people will have urinary retention. So I have seen people develop uh, renal failure due to urinary retention on some of these medications. Allergies are rare. Um, respiratory depression is rare in patients who use these medications for medical reasons. Um, Two-thirds of patients who have um, respiratory depression or where their breathing is reduced below a level that can support the oxygen or where they have actually respiratory arrests are not the person for whom the medication is prescribed. So if you're taking um, an opioid medication, make sure that you're storing it in a locked box. Um, during periods of time uh, where you're more susceptible to the side effects of pain medication, uh, you should talk with your provider about reducing the dose of your pain medication. Uh, this is particularly true with fentanyl patches where you will get accelerated release of the fentanyl into the system during times where you might have a fever. Uh, although, th although this is not approved by the FDA, what I tell patients to do is to fold their patch in half during times where they might be febrile, where they might have influenza or pneumonia, and cover the unopposed side with scotch tape so that the, the patch will stay on the skin. Uh, before cutting your dosages of your medications, you should talk to your provider. Uh, try to avoid using other sedating medications alongside uh, prescription opioids, uh, such as uh, lorazepam or alprazolam or clonazepam. Um, or sleep medication as the, um, the side effects of those medications will escalate the potential for sedation with the opioid medication. Uh, if you're using more than 50 to 100 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent per day, make sure that there's a pr prescription for nal naloxone available and that um, your uh, caregivers um, are aware of how to administer that medication but also expect that you may need to administer that, that medication, the, the antidote to an overdose of naloxone if um, somebody gets into your medications. Um, naloxone is available in an intranasal formulation, so nasal spray, and most insurance companies are actually covering it. Um, as I said before, keep your medications in a locked box. Um, People with uh, chronic illness and their families will also often commonly confuse the development of physical um, withdrawal symptoms if they abruptly discontinue the medication with addiction. So physical withdrawal symptoms include things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, actually escalations in abdominal pain and joint pain. And this is uh, pretty much universally expected if somebody is taking more than the equivalent of one milligram IV morphine um, per hour. So typically what doctors will do when pain resolves is they will taper the medication by about 20% per day in the setting of an acute pain uh, to lessen the likelihood of physical withdrawal symptoms. It's um, analogous to a person living with insulin requiring diabetes be being without their insulin. Um, so uh, to manage your risk of addiction to opioid medications, be open with your provider about a prior history of substance use and mental illness. Um, many patients will fear that if they're open with their provider that their provider will be very judgmental and will not adequately manage the symptom. I think most stem cell providers are um, pretty familiar with the occurrence of chronic pain and would be less likely than the average uh, provider to um, not use an opioid medication in a setting where it's indicated. Uh, keep a log of how you take your medication. 
Uh, your provider will probably need to order a urine drug test. It's mandated by insurance uh, uh, companies now that people have a urine drug test at least once a year. Uh, they will probably want to do a pain management agreement with you that will define expectations of the benefits and side effects of the medication as well as other indicated modalities uh, that they'll probably want you to be um, trying out at the same time. Uh, again, keep your medications in a lockbox. Uh, the CDC, uh, three years ago I think now, uh, came up with guidelines for um, dose limitations for opioid medications outside the context of uh, palliative care or end of life settings. And they're recommending that people be maintained on less than 50 to 100 milligrams per day. Um, a lot of these guidelines are not really robustly evidence-based. They're very, very reactive, and I think it's really put a lot of patients with chronic pain from life-limiting conditions in a very difficult place. 41% um, of primary care clinics, uh, this study was published in JAMA a few months back, indicated that they would not accept new patients into their practice if they were receiving uh, opioid medications like Percocet. Uh, so there's a, a lot of paranoia in the medical community about prescribing these medications, and uh, it's exposing patients to much higher risk than the uh, risk from the opioid medications themselves. Um, the Commission on Cancer has um, required in the last several years that distress screening, including screening for depression uh, and pain, be part of the routine care of patients who are receiving care in cancer centers that receive accreditation from them. Uh, although many modalities like mindfulness, psychotherapy, acupuncture are evidence-based, they are often not covered by insurance or require big out-of-pocket expenses. So for people who've um, depleted their financial resources due to the strain of having a life-limiting illness, uh, they're often not accessible for patients. Um, ask about grants that support programs uh, or visit your local cancer support center such as Gilda's Club, which will likely have a lot of these interventions available. Um, complementary and alternative medicine is the um, old-fashioned term for integrative medicine. So there is a robust evidence base that supports the efficacy of these modalities. And it's, um, it's not complimentary because people are usually paying out of pocket for it. Um, so about half of patients with chronic neurological conditions uh, have sought help from in integrative medicine pro providers. Um, and it's, it's effective. So 60% of patients who use inter integrative medicine modalities derive a, gr a great deal of benefit from these modalities. Um, about 80% of veterans who've been studied acknowledge using integrative medicine modalities, and uh, all were willing to try four of the modalities that were studied, including massage, acupuncture, uh, chiropractic interventions, and herbal medicine. Um, acupuncture has been found to be effective in acute procedural pain, as well as in chronic pain in the setting of cancer. Uh, so the, uh, our uh, study in patients with breast cancer compared traditional acupuncture to sham acupuncture. Uh, sham acupuncture is where the acupuncture needles are inserted in non-traditional um, um, uh, meridians. And it was found to be effective for joint pain in patients who were receiving aromatase inhibitors. Um, acupuncture, consult with your um, a stem cell uh, provider prior to doing it if, if you have low um, platelet counts or if your white cell count is low. Uh, psychological modalities have the same level of efficacy for uh, uh, patients with uh, chronic pain. Um, other interventions that may, may be effective include art therapy, music therapy, uh, randomized uh, clinical trials have shown benefits for hypnosis or procedural pain and uh, perioperative pain. Uh, mindfulness interventions, as little as five minutes a day of mindfulness interventions uh, may lessen the severity of chronic pain. Uh, it's been found to be effective for acute and uh, long-term relief of chronic back pain. Uh, 
older adults, there's less of an evidence base. Uh, uh, this study, a uh, randomized clinical trial of a mindfulness intervention versus a multidisciplinary pain clinic, uh, found that the mindfulness intervention was a, a, as effective as um, the chronic pain clinic at reducing pain intensity and lessening uh, distress associated with pain. Uh, there's uh, a fair degree of evidence in regard to yoga for um, helping with chronic pain. Um, I would encourage you uh, to work with a yoga teacher who's certified for working with patients with chronic illnesses. Um, commonly in um, yoga studios uh, uh, or yoga classes, people will be pushing you into poses that you're not ready to get into and they may exacerbate the pain. Um, so chair yoga or uh, restorative yoga may be um, pretty beneficial. We're actually fortunate at, at Rush, a colleague of mine, uh, one of our palliative medicine physicians, um, took a sabbatical to learn how to be a yoga teacher, so she's working with patients now. Um, when uh, beginning exercise, um, start with moderate weight-bearing exercise, such as walking or swimming. Um, don't do more than five to seven minutes initially, three to five times a week. The mistake that most of us make when we start exercising after not having exercised for a long time is that we overdo it initially and will cause um, additional injuries. Uh, when you're increasing the amount of exercise that you do, don't increase it by more than 10% uh, per week. Uh, it, and also, if you're over the age of 50, you should consult with your primary care provider about doing a stress test. Um, ask your doctor or your provider about resources for patients. Here in Chicago, the Park District Gym um, will allow people to use their facilities at low price or no price. Um, so has anybody used medical marijuana? Okay. Um, talk to your provider before using it. If you're on um, uh, tacrolimus or prograf, um, marijuana, when used um, heavily, can actually cause uh, the accumulation of tacrolimus and their case reports, uh, usually in the context of when patients are undergoing their stem cell transplant of people having toxicity from their tacrolimus. Um, uh, street marijuana is often contaminated with fungal spores or bacteria and is commonly laced with PCP. Uh, patients who are immunosuppressed are at greater risk of infection. Uh, there's some evidence for its effectiveness in neuropathic pain. CBD is the, for, um, the f chemical in marijuana that helps with pain primarily. So when we're endorsing patients using this, typically we're using it uh, or recommending it in patients who have um, not undergone stem cell transplant because we worry when they're on tacrolimus about their having toxicity. Um, there's some evidence that patients who use medical marijuana will uh, decrease their use of uh, pain medications by about 25%. Mimi, is it available in Maryland? It isn't available in BC. It's becoming available in Maryland. Um, I think the big challenge for me is what we're calling medical marijuana. And I think where I think we have to make a distinction is I don't care what people do for recreational, for recreational marijuana. Um, Sorry, if we're recommending the use of a medication, we should hold it to the same standard that we are any other medication. So if I'm asking that you take oxycodone or acetaminophen, I can say this is how many milligrams you should take so many times a day. And I can't say that with marijuana. Um, CBD is interesting because it's showing up, it, where did I see it last week, like home goods or something like that. Interestingly, about half of the products that are labeled as CBD turn out not to have any CBD in them. Mm -hmm. The advantage to <coughs> CBD is that it's not psychoactive, but I think the really difficult thing about the concept of medical marijuana is if we are calling it medical, then and this is merely my opinion and does not reflect the opinion of the National Institutes of Health, um, we should hold it to the same standard that we do any other medication and say, if you want to use recreational marijuana and that works for you, that's fabulous, but what are we saying about the medical part of it? Does that make sense? 
And um, there has been a limited research uh, base in marijuana because the federal government has restricted access to research level marijuana, so it's a paradox. Um, we recommend that people use edibles or topical forms uh, and not smoke marijuana. There is a marked increase in the risk of uh, heart attacks in people who have underlying coronary disease who smoke marijuana. Um, less of a concern with topical or oral. Uh, the topical and the oral takes much longer to work than the um, <coughs> smoked or vaped marijuana, but tends to work uh, for longer. We, we also advise patients not to use it within a couple of hours of the initial doses. They're much more likely to have psychological side effects of it if they take multiple doses in short succession. Uh, THC is more psychologically active. It does help with cancer-associated um, loss of appetite um, and is used in pill form as dronabinol for the promotion of appetite in HIV disease and cancer. Um, doctors can't tell the dispensaries what to give, and the dispensaries will typically do their own thing. So in conclusion, uh, we can advise patients what to get, but here in Illinois, we cannot direct the dispensaries what to give. Okay. So it's pharmacist making decisions or the person who happens to own the store. So unlike any other medication, the physicians are being kept out of the recommendations for how to use medical marijuana. And frankly, and you probably know more about this than I do, I couldn't tell you the different efficacy of different strains and brands. Mm -hmm. um, however, I do know when my son lived in California, he could get home delivery of marijuana. So it kind of depends where you live. Um, so in conclusion, uh, chronic pain is common in patients who have uh, GVHD. The approach to it should be multimodal. It should focus on the whole patient and the, the whole family. Uh, and the approaches should be multidimensional. It should include involvement of other professionals with um, different skill sets, so occupational therapists, physical therapists, social workers, psychologists. Uh, medications have a role, but they have limited benefit and have side effects. Routinely discuss with your physician how pain is impacting on your quality of life and daily activities with your providers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Mahony. We will now take questions, and we have plenty of time for questions, so don't be shy. And Laura in the back will bring the mic. Uh, everything's being recorded, so we want to make sure we're using the mics. Uh, we'll help you with uh, stating your question, and she's right behind you, sir. Okay, Dr. O'Mahony, since you got on this marijuana situation here, what differentiates uh, what differentiates medical marijuana from recreational marijuana? Um, a lot of states, recreational marijuana is not legal. Here in Illinois, it will become legally available as of January the 1st. Um, medicinal marijuana is where patients are using it for chronic illness. The question is, on January 2nd, what differentiates between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana? Um, Illinois. Great question. I don't know this for sure, but I've been told by a patient that medicinal marijuana will be tax deductible. Recreational will In other words, there's no medical differentiation, in other right. words. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that um, not to use um, marijuana with TACRO. Can you use the... Um, my husband uses a, um, a CBD oil rub for pain, but he's still on a little bit of Tacro. Is that a bad thing? So um, I have only seen case reports uh, in the literature of people who've had Tacro Lyme's toxicity in the context of when they're undergoing their stem cell transplant. So people who are using gummies in the hospital without letting their providers <laughs> know. But I haven't seen it in the context of people with chronic 
um, GVHD. Um, intuitively, that might be because when you're in the hospital, you're on a lot of other medications that might inhibit the metabolism of tacrolimus, like um, antifungals and antibiotics. I think the other part of that is a lot of the things that are listed as CBH, C, excuse me, that cream, CBD creams or oils. Mm -hmm. If you look at, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the ingredient list, there's, <coughs> excuse me, very often a lot of menthol in them and other things like that. Uh, the ingredients of any compound, whether it's breakfast cereal or a CBD cream, have to be listed in the order of their concentration. So in the best cereals, sugar is always the first ingredient, for example. If you look at the ingredient of a lot of the creams and <clears throat> oils that are CBD creams, CBD is the last ingredient, which tells you there's very, very little in there. And very often the, effect, the benefit that people get is from the menthol rubs like an icy hot or biofreeze. Um, so it's good to compare. And the only reason I say that is things that have CBD in them seem to have their prices just about double than the same thing without CBD. And I just feel like it's gotten so trendy. We're paying a whole lot more for things that may not have a benefit. So try, and I don't get any benefit from the company, unfortunately, but try a biofreeze or something like that and see if you get the same efficacy, unless it's a pure CBD. Right, right, right. But will, will the CBD adversely affect the tacrolimus or cause problems with tacrolimus? I agree you with don't Dr. Know. O'Mahony. I don't think we know that, but it has, okay. it, it just hasn't been studied as much. Okay. Case reports, um, I've seen that is this happened, an article in which it says this happened to this person, but we, don't, we can't generalize from that and say, therefore, nobody should do it. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Mahone. Hi. I so I can see you. I actually had my transplant at Rush Hospital six years ago, January. I had Dr. Nathan, who was my, part of my team. Um, right now, I have GVHD, and I'm on 25 of prednisone. I just feel wonderful, but I know I can't stay on it. So what would your suggestion be once I go off of it? I have used the CBD oil in the past because I have it in my joints. When I first went to my doctor, I actually had knee surgery, total knee replacement, and then 15 weeks later was diagnosed with ALL and PH chromosome disorder. And you know he wouldn't give me any more pain medicine because he said they're only limited to, I think, three months and then I'd have to go to another doctor. But then we found out I had the, so what would you suggest after, they're gonna take me, it's gonna take a while for me to get off of the prednisone so I can feel great for, for a long time. But um, I mean, I've lived with the pain because the doctors just kind of, you know, they say, are you having pain? I go, well, yeah, it's like three, four. That's, a, that's where it goes. Nobody does anything. See a palliative medicine provider, um, maybe see an occupational therapist, mm -hmm. physical therapist. Um, yeah. Medications do have a role, uh, and people can be on medication long term. Um, many people are on those medications for many years. Uh, and so long as you're using multimodal approaches, um, there, are, there are things that may help the pain. Just using one type of intervention alone is probably going to have limited traction or efficacy. So use a couple different things yeah. to help it. Okay. I think also see if you can get an acupuncturist. More insurance companies are covering acupuncture because it has been shown to be opioid sparing. But I'm going to say if you use an acupuncturist, don't go to the one at the spa, don't go to the one in the mall. Find a Chinese trained acupuncturist um, very often they'll have the letter CMD after their name, so they really know what they're doing. Yeah, I had it done once on a cruise, and I'm at, that thing hurt. Yeah, no. <laughs> and it, it, it shouldn't hurt. But again, don't go to your cruise acupuncturist who's doing it to get there four hours in the sun every day. You want someone who this is their profession. So there's an acupuncturist in the Cancer Center at Rush, and there's a grant that supports um, a couple of treatments uh, at no charge as well. Um, some people may have long-standing pain relief from only one or two treatments of acupuncture. Some people need to do a full course of acupuncture before they start to have the emergence of relief. Well, I came from Tennessee to get my transplant. I live in Tennessee, okay. and I'd have to check there to see because it's a long trip up here. But I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Someone back here. Hi, 
Hi. Um, my question is about the um, pain management for GVHD of the gut. And um, I have a 15-year-old. I see a lot of older patients here. Um, it's a lot more difficult when you're dealing with a child. As to an adult, at least they can tell you exactly how they feel compared to a child. So um, my question is, what's the best medication for this GI um, pain? And I, in your slide, you said something about herbal medication being effective. I just wanted to know what kind of herbal medication or are they really effective and where one can get such medications? Um, herbal agents, there are some agents that do have an evidence base. For example, turmeric may help with um, joint or bone pain. Um, there's um, a NIH um, website that has about 100 agents that have been s studied. I think it's called Herb Resource List. So I should know it, but I just go to Dr. Google and say complementary and alternatives at NIH, and it'll take you there. Uh, also take a look at the Sloan Kettering uh, Complementary Medicine uh, website. It has a lot of good information there. Um, there is no one best medication. Um, it's still somewhat of a trial and error process. For example, the opioid medications work on different um, pain uh, receptors, and we don't have um, uh, blood tests that are covered by insurance companies to determine what a person's profile, uh, receptor profile is up front. So it's still somewhat of a trial and error process. So different people have different sensitivity to the pain relieving effect of a medication uh, or more susceptibility to the side effects of a medication. Uh, so the common side effects that people will have are GI side effects like nausea or constipation, uh, problems with concentration. Uh, some people report that they feel um, sleepy. Um, there's theoretic evidence to suggest that uh, opioid medications may have an immune suppressing effect. Um, in patients who are on these medications long term, there may also be elevation in um, hormones that promote depression. Um, they may also cause susceptibility to things like osteoporosis as well. The other thing that is sometimes helpful is ginger, especially for nausea and vomiting. And in people who have vertigo, sometimes ginger helps with the um, nausea that comes from that. More worried about him being dependent on those medications, and um, as much as they try to wean him off the oxycodone, that's why they put him on the methadone. But I sometimes he needs more of the of the oxycodone to get him, you know, to a certain level before it actually kicks in. So my fear is just being him being dependent on the oxycodone. Um, sure. So I think in, um, in terms of tapering the medication, it's important that uh, when providers are tapering medication that they reduce it in small percentages and do it slowly over time. Um, and I think what can happen is if they do it too precipitously is uh, they'll precipitate physical withdrawal symptoms which will include pain abdominal pain, joint pain. Um, it needs to be done gently over time and not in, you know, 20 percent reductions every visit. And I think uh, the current guidelines by the CDC are not helpful in that regard. 
I think the other thing, the other distinction to make is you use the word dependence. And yes, any person who's been on opioids for a long period of time is dependent. But that's be, it's like taking a steroid. So you gave the example of being on a steroid for a long period of time. Your body is used to it, and if we stopped it too quickly, as you said, you would have side effects. That's the same thing with opioids. If we stop it too quickly, you'll have side effects. But that is not addiction. Addiction is the pursuit of the use of a medication or other substance to the extent that you are causing harm to yourself, to your relationships, and to other things like that. So the need for a medication for pain relief is very different from the need for a medication for a, for a high. And I think one of the most important things Dr. Mahoney said is when you have a complex pain situation as you have in your family, find a palliative medicine provider because they know what they're doing, they're comfortable working within the, the rules, if you will. So every, we've all heard about the Center for Disease Control 2016 recommendations, but you also have to know when those rules don't apply, which is very often in this field. So it's, again, it's build your team, find people who are comfortable with your son's condition and comfortable with your son's pain and who will work with you to say maybe getting him off right now is not a bad idea or is not a good idea. Methadone is very good and very helpful, but again, you have to know, you almost can't tell people he's on methadone because they'll assume that he's an addict if he's on methadone. That happens with our patients all the time that we wanna put them on methadone and they say, but isn't that for people who have an addiction problem? And what I tell them is that the numbers that are used to treat addiction are 80, 90, 120 milligrams. And the amount we use to treat pain are two and a half milligrams, five milligrams, 10 milligrams. So it works differently and it's a very good medication. But you're in a difficult position. You feel, you never feel that you're doing enough for your children and you need to find people who will help you and remind you that you're doing all the good things for your son. Okay, what about the use of gabapentin for the pain that he has? Um, now he has this pain on his feet. He has pain on his feet. And then um, he complains of being like those um, prickly kind of pain when you know, he stands on them and you know, so he's on gabapentin as well. And I don't know exactly what those things control. Is it just the pain, the nerve pain, or it also helps in the gut pain? It's all pain, pain medications. I don't know which, I mean, what happens. The methadone is on a very small dose. It's on five milligrams. And um, the oxy is on 7.5 because five milligrams wasn't doing it anymore. So. It's all pain medications, but I don't know which one is controlling what. So uh, maybe if I, you can explain a little bit about that gabapentin, if it, what it actually does, because he feels he's not doing anything for him. So. Again, the response rate to medications like gabapentin, about a third to 50% of people will respond to an individual medication. They may require trials of multiple different um, medications that work for neuropathic pain. Um, the gabapentin in gut GVHD may have a role at reducing hypersensitivity of the nerves in the gut. The medical term for that is um, hyperalgesia. Um, but typically people will need to try a couple of different adjuvants before they'll find one that, that helps. There is no one magic uh, bullet. People will need to try multiple different approaches. But it also can work for the peripheral neuropathy that you described, the buzzing, tingling in his feet. Um, the other thing that's very good for peripheral neuropathy, and I'm sounding like a commercial, is acupuncture. Mm -hmm. That acupuncture has remarkable results in peripheral neuropathy. It may take as many as eight sessions and sometimes longer, and insurance is covering it more. So if your insurance company says no, ask them if they'll help you. But again, use your, use your organizations. Use your social worker to help you get through. Um, and as Dr. O'Mahony said, more and more cancer centers are having acupuncturists on board. Are there any other questions? This side of the room, anyone? Hi. 
My question is, I have a lot of chest pain, and you had mentioned about muscle cramping of the thorax, and I don't know what a thorax is. <laughs> and would that be something that would be indicative of this? Because I have, a lot of times people say, well, you better go to the doctor or go to the emergency room right now because you're having chest pains because they think I'm having a heart attack. And it's like, nope, I just gotta wait a few minutes and it'll go away. And is that what you were referring to in terms of the thorax? Yeah, the thorax is the, um, basically from here to here. Okay. Uh, the, the chest. Um, chest pain that we should all worry about being associated with cardiac disease would be typically left-sided, radiating into the left arm, oftentimes as maybe associated with shortness of breath or nausea. It's oftentimes precipitated by increase in activity. Um, you, you, should th you should think about going to the emergency room if you're having an acute onset of, of chest pain. Um, other concerns might be things like a pulmonary embolus or a clot in the lung. Uh, but a, you know, a pain that is um, associated with tenderness when you press on the area where you're experiencing the pain is liable to be uh, musculoskeletal. So how would you be able to tell the difference if it's the muscle pain? Because like a lot of times mine will be on either side or in the middle and it's like a javelin going right through you. And you can almost feel it in the back sometimes, but that's probably psycho, psychology or something like that. But it just, you know, it really hurts. And then last time my doctor sent me to the emergency room and they hooked me up and they says, oh my God, you're gonna be here for days. And later that night I was out because they were like, couldn't find nothing wrong with me because mm -hmm. it had passed. Mm -hmm. So. I actually have a question. Dr. O'Mahony, you had mentioned in your presentation uh, exposing them to much bigger risks than the opioid addiction. Could you just clarify sure. what you meant by that? Um, so uh, three quarters of the new um, heroin users in this country um, were previously um, taking pain medications. And uh, I cited a study that came out in JAMA earlier this year uh, uh, Forty-one percent of studied primary care clinics indicated they would not accept patients into their practice who were receiving opioid medications. <laughs> so you have patients who may have been using these medications safely for years, maybe many years, who are finding that if they need to see a new primary care provider, that vast numbers of them are unwilling to prescribe these medications. and. Um, it's, it's really telling that a large proportion of the new heroin users uh, in the country were previously taking pain medication. I, th I think it's because the medical community is doing a disservice to these patients. I agree. And regulatory agencies. Say that again? And regulatory agencies as well. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a few minutes left. When you say medications have limitations, I'm on amitriptyline, fentanyl, and prednisone, and I still have pain. So, have my have have I reached a level where those are no longer working for me, and I should be seeking telling my doctor that we have to try new. I don't want to add more pain meds. <coughs> Sometimes if you're rotated to another pain medication, you may have uh, better sensitivity to that pain medication because of your receptor profile. Um, <coughs> people will build up tolerance to pain medications over time and may need higher doses. Um, if, if you've not been on other um, opioid medications, you may have a better response to them. The concern with the amitriptyline in 
um, adults when we're older than 50 in particular is that the side effect profile of amitriptyline um, can limit uh, titration of the medication, uh, concerns about cardiac side effects and um, other adjuvants um, for um, neuropathic pain may have less of those concerns, so there may be some benefit to rotating to another adjuvant me medication for neuropathic pain. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, right over here. Pass the mic. What do you think about blue light therapy for neuralgia, for the neurological pain? Um, I, I haven't studied it. I can't comment. My other question is, for the medical profession, what kind of education are you getting on the use of marijuana? CBD? Um, Self-directed. Um, Is it improving? I think there's, um, there's a lot more interest in it. Um, I think that, for example, at Rush, we had a grand rounds from a public health physician who's uh, in Denver, in Colorado, who spoke about the experience there. Uh, we have a regional palliative uh, education program that we've uh, included programming on uh, medicinal marijuana. Because you, you, know, you talked about not knowing <coughs> different types of marijuana. You know, to, when it becomes legal in Illinois, you can't say to go to a dispensary and get this certain type because um, and, you know, the different concentrations of the THC varies with the different type of marijuana. Um, I think that's what I'm kind of asking is, you know, where the education is going to help, to help the patients. To, you know, there have been limited studies on how effective um, marijuana is for chronic pain, um, and it would be help for the, helpful for the consumers who know nothing about marijuana to have some guidance. I think part of the challenge is that, and I apologize for choking, um, <laughs> is that it's not a matter of having knowledge to disseminate. We don't know the answer to that, because in this country, marijuana is a Schedule One medication. It cannot be studied until the government changes marijuana to a, a class two medication so that it can be studied, we won't know. So it's not that the knowledge doesn't exist. And frankly, it's going to, in, there was a, a journal that just came out last week in which every article in it is about cannabidiol and um, marijuana and medical uses, but a lot of it is here's a little bit that we know, but there's so much that we don't know. So we would almost be irresponsible to say, try this. Um, and again, because I can't say, if I were putting someone on a medication like dizipramine, I could say take 10 milligrams of this pill at bedtime every night. For marijuana, I can't do that. Therefore, it would be irresponsible of me to say, go to this dispensary and use this purple plant. Because I, we, I I don't know personally, but the knowledge doesn't exist. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to wrap this up.